and welcome to the first counterintuition.com podcast. I'm Gareth O'Shea John, the host of counterintuition.com, and I'm joined by Alec Gourley, who runs fractionallyreserved.com. Alec, thanks for joining me. Why don't you go ahead and uh, tell us a bit about yourself? Yeah, it's great to be here on the podcast. Yeah, I run fractionallyreserved.com. So it's really the world as it should be seen. I guess I'm coming at it from a libertarian point of view with a little bit of Austrian economics added in there. And it's basically just the world that's around us really isn't what people think it is. Uh, and I think it's time for people to stop being sheep, basically. So that's the point of view that we're coming from. And like what you're doing with counterintuition is just to give people a little bit of a break from the mainstream status quo and just give them a little bit to think over every day as well. Absolutely. Well, it's great to have you join me. So, um, yeah, so I just today, I guess we should just talk a little bit about, um, obviously, it's a big deal. I know I'm, we're probably biting off more than we can chew here talking about democracy as an issue for the very first for the very first podcast, but just maybe we'll get a rounded um, explanation as to why, I mean, why is it people, they grow up in, we'll talk from the Irish perspective, but I know it's, you know, it's England, it's America, it's all over Europe, that it's really this unchallenged idea that, oh, of course, democracy is the best way to organize society. The, the alternative is tyranny and dictatorships, or we all get to vote, and it's like this wonderful thing, and if there's anything wrong in the social order, it's not democracy, it's because we have, you know, crooked politicians, or not enough people are going out to vote, or that's, the problem is everybody else except for the organization itself uh, of, yeah. of, of society in this democ democratic order, but I just wanted to point out a few kind of fallacies um, and maybe just get your get your feedback on it. This is an epiphany I had last week, and I, I know it just when you're when you're dealing with this kind of stuff because you know you and me and so many others in our kind of movement um, are having to counter a lot of stuff that we've grown up with. So it's probably like you know like with me every day I'm getting my mind blown whenever I study out this kind of stuff. Study out you know that when you go back to first principles and you really try and break down the world around you that you just everybody else just kind of takes for granted. Um, and you really just look at stuff for, like as if it's for the first time, like you're an alien and you just land on Earth and you just look at something and go, wow, that's so crazy. How, how do we all just kind of buy that? So like this, this one epiphany I had last week, it just totally took me by surprise where I was just thinking, OK, so you have democracy, this idea that, you know, you want to get a majority of people together um, and if they consent to a certain thing, then that's obviously the best way to go. And so let's all just do that thing. So I, I, I thought to myself, OK. Under what condition, if everything was reset, if all of society was completely blank and there's, there's nothing set up and we all just get this opportunity to, for the very first time, lay out how we're all going to interact with each other, would democracy be something that we'd come up with? Because if you look at the idea, okay, so the optimal, the very best case scenario for democracy, right, is you get everybody turning out to, to poll. Okay, so everybody, everybody in the whole country gets out. I mean, aside from people who can't vote or whatever, but everybody who can vote gets out and they vote, and you get the optimal turnout, and it's anywhere between 51 and 100 percent of the population. Well, if you can get anywhere from 100 percent and 51 percent of the population to do anything, why do you need democratic government? Couldn't they just do that thing? Wouldn't it be more sensible for us to uh, say, okay, so obviously enough, all these people, they want education for our kids. Um, so 51% of the population wants, wants education. Uh, some entrepreneur or some series of entrepreneurs around the country would go, oh, wow, people want this. I'm going to set up a school and charge them money. You don't need 100% of the people to go out and set up school and teach their kids. You just need 100% of the people or 50% or, or whatever to just want the thing. And then a handful of entrepreneurs are going to provide it like everything else. Like you look at, you look at Apple with their iPhone, they have a 13% market share in smartphones. That's, that's nowhere near a majority, but they're like a household name. Like everybody knows iPhone. And they, they have 13% of the support just in the smartphone market. So... You know, if you can get 13% of people to make something a multi-billion dollar or whatever it is, uh, you know, company, then why in the world would you need a, a forceful government then to come in, take money, and then forcibly allocate it? So, so it couldn't possibly come about as, you know, a, a majority of people say, okay, we need to have democracy. So the only possible way democracy could come about is actually a very small minority saying, I want everybody else to, to go this way. So we need to have this small group set up in order to force the rest of everybody to do a certain thing. There's no way democracy could come about as a majority decision. So why, why should the majority be subject to it? 
Anyway, that was my, that probably went on a bit long, but that, that was, this is crazy <laughs> epiphany. I don't, oh my goodness. So, and we just kind of buy it like, all oh, right, yeah, democracy, it's great, it's for everybody. But really, no, it isn't, because if it was for everybody, we just have, you know, it's like Tesco is there. We don't all vote on which bread to have next week. We don't all vote on which one brand of, you know, of, of Coke to have. We, you know, we can choose. We have Coke, Pepsi, we've got some discount brands. And if you don't want to buy it, you don't have to. And, and that's pretty much what it comes down to. You, you don't have to. There's nothing in this world that you should have to submit to that way. So I, I guess what I wanted to just maybe just get your feedback on it. Maybe, maybe I mean, am I wrong here? Is, 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 is there something I'm missing? And I'm totally open to any criticism of that. Is there something I'm missing in that? No, I, I don't think you are. I mean, the thing is, like taking out the example that you made there, you don't do your shopping in the same supermarket every week. <laughs> right. <laughs> Number one, and you don't buy all your products in the one supermarket either. Right. I mean, right. that's the thing. You're not necessarily concerned as well what that supermarket stands for. <laughs> I mean, <laughs> if they're giving you the best deal to take it from that level. But to take it on another point as well, I mean, as you say in Slave Ruler and in, in Civic Duty, I mean, you know, there's the option to engage and not engage as well. Um, you know, I mean, have you ever been tempted yourself to be involved in the democratic system? Well, absolutely. I, I think anybody, anybody who's uh, taken any interest in, because that was my thing. I mean, I always wanted to to be involved in uh, something important, do something important. You know, obviously, a, a lot of people have, but I I took an interest in politics a few years ago as thinking that oh, that's that that would be the way to go, and just only recently it's just occurred to me that well, that really that really couldn't i don't I, I don't think that's the solution because the solution is is more political power the the problem that i'm identifying is political power and that it's basically using force against people who yeah. who don't want a certain thing so the, like the whole point of democracy like when you say like even i remember my teachers telling me in school that you know you have to get in there and stop the you know there's crooked politicians well you have to go in there and then the crooked politicians won't have anywhere to operate from. But the problem with that is that's that's me. Then now I'm the person determining, you know, the best healthcare, the best school set up, the best, you know, what's the yeah. optimal level of taxation. I mean, there's there's no way any like you could have the smartest, most moral person on planet Earth and put them the the, the head over, um, you know, a democratic system, and it's just gonna explode. I mean, there's no there's no way it can work because it's it's not you know it 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 completely ignores the power that of the marketplace of individuals to make decisions and to, and to coordinate. But I think it's, it comes from a place of really, really, um, disdaining people in general. Like you have to have so little respect for people that they can't make decisions themselves. But there is that. I mean, I mean, there's the other thing. I mean, the marketplace, the market itself is, is a, you know, is a system made up of individuals. And I think that's what people forget. The market is some abstract thing to a lot of commentators and to most of the population, but it's actually, you know, made up of individual decisions. And if you want to take it at the Austrian level, it's all these tiny individual human actions that make the market. You know, I mean, beat the market. Well, beat everybody's tiny little individual human actions every second of every minute of every day. But I mean, like you were saying there about the, the minority concentration of power, you know, people making decisions for the majority. I mean, if we take it to an international level, you have, uh, you know, you have Barack Obama, who really didn't win anywhere near 50% of the popular vote in the last election, and he's the most powerful person on the planet. I mean, th there's that with kind of a little bit of a worry as well. You know, I think in our case, in an Irish context, it's even worse because you have proportional representation. You're not voting Democrat or Republican. You're voting number one to 15 on every candidate, and chances are most of the time your 15 choice is going to be the guy who gets elected. Absolutely. I'm actually funny you brought that up. I, I made some notes. I was just going to talk a little bit about uh, uh, Fina Gale, how they got in last time. They, when you mm. look at the actual turnout for that that election, so you have you know 4.5 million uh, people in Ireland, 3.1 are eligible voters. Um, the turnout for for the last general election that put Fina Gale in power was uh, two million two hundred twenty something something like that. Just just about you know two million and a quarter, um, but only eight hundred and one thousand. Uh, just a little over 801,000 voted for Fine Gael. So that's 18% of Ireland. That's So everybody who's affected, which of course includes kids, you know, who obviously can't vote, 
um, but they're still affected by it. To be born as well, if you're absolutely massive debt as well. That's correct. That's correct. And yeah, that's actually that's another good point. I mean, if if we respect it, if we give kids any bit of respect, we don't because they can't vote, of course. But uh, yeah. but and that's the politicians aren't just you know completely. They're not even on the radar because there's you know there's another twenty years before they vote or whatever. So but um but even the next generation of kids, I mean the the reason we're in debt right now. Is because we accept that our kids are going to pay it and our grandkids are going to pay this this massive debt. Now, of course, they they're not, as far as I'm concerned, legally obligated to that because not being born, they can't engage in a contract in the first place. So it's it's not like you know. I mean, we make the argument, that, oh yeah, but we're making a better country for them, and you know. That, but how are we doing that? Like, I mean, <laughs> you know, we're basically yeah, exactly, yeah. You know, being born into debt is not a better country. So uh, so yeah, so um, yeah, so you know, back to your point. Um, yeah, eighteen percent of the of the population put the current government in in power. And again, if you were to go to that eighteen percent and ask them, yeah, so about all those promises that they they made and and you voted yeah. for and you got them, in, how, how many of those have they actually come through and and paid off on? And you know, how happy are you with their performance? I think you get a, a much more uh, um, anorexic number. <laughs> yeah, I mean, it's it, it's crazy. I mean, anyone if you ask someone would they vote for Fine Gael again now, or especially Labour, who are the the junior coalition partner in Ireland, most of those people would say no. So, I mean, you basically have a majority government with a huge majority who have been elected by, as you say, 18%. If you ask them now, probably closer to 9% with the collapse in the vote um, that they'd probably receive at the moment, you know, which is 91, 90% being ruled by 10%. You know, I mean, that's, that's absolutely crazy. I mean, I think your point raises another thing. I mean, would the, uh, you know, the young aspirational Obama or the end of Kenny who decided to get into politics in, fir- in the first place vote for Barack Obama as he is today or vote for end of Kenny as he is today? I doubt it very much. Mm. I mean, that's the thing. I mean, the only way of solving this is to put really everybody's name on the list. So you have your choice of parties. But the only way I can see out of this is another box that you can tick that says none of the above. Right. As you say, I mean, and as you said countless times, what you have is you have the illusion of choice. You can choose anything you want to do. You know, you can choose any of these candidates, but it's already a pre-elected platform. There is no choice. I don't want any of these guys. You know, that's not reflected. It's either you use your vote or you don't use your vote. You can't say, well, I want none of these guys. You that's, know, that's, that's never recorded. Yeah. And that, that's a big deal because I've heard the, the argument, you know, if you don't vote, you don't have the right to, to complain, that kind of thing, where people say that, okay, but at least go out and, and do something. But I, I don't, like, if I turned around tomorrow, maybe we'll take my whole neighborhood and I'll get everybody together. We're holding a vote that I get to take 20 euro for my next door neighbor. Uh, no, first example. Let's just take it. So he's not even he's not even home. So he didn't even hear about it. Yeah. And he comes home, and I'm like, okay, uh, where's my twenty euro? He's like, what? And I would say, oh, you irresponsible person! You didn't. You don't even know what's going on in your neighborhood. We we held a vote, and I, I am entitled to twenty euro. We, we all decided. Being, you were out being productive. Yeah, exactly. You were out. <laughs> you were out at your job. there making somebody happy. You know, serving in the market or whatever. And uh, and and you didn't uh, you didn't set aside some of your time, and so that's your first example. The next example would be okay. He's actually there, and he knows about it, and he votes no, <laughs> and then everybody else votes yes because I've promised to give them each a euro, and I get to keep a ten myself. Um, and then we say that's legitimate, and of course it isn't. And so, oh, but you don't have the right to complain because you voted. So which is it? You know, I mean, if he doesn't vote, he gets aggressed upon. If he does vote, he gets aggressed upon. You know, either way, I I think you really I I would say you don't have a right to vote. Well, you have a, a right to complain no matter what, but um, but you more so have a right to complain when you don't engage yeah. because at least by by voting you're consenting to the outcome. You're saying, okay, out of these five or ten or fifteen um, people, whoever comes out, I'm consenting to them because if if there was someone on there I wanted, so let's say you know one of the fifteen, I I actually want this person in, and if they get in. I would expect everybody else to follow suit and say, okay, well, this guy got in. We all went by the rules. This guy got in. So now you have to listen to him. 
So if my guy doesn't get in, well, I can't change now. I have to say, well, yeah, okay, I have to, I have to go by what this guy says. So if I don't vote, I, I've never consented to any of it, and, and I'm, you know, perfectly happy complaining. <laughs> I'm perfectly happy saying, you know, but I'm sorry. But even that guy you voted for, I mean, it goes back to your original point about concentration of power as well. Even that guy you probably voted for has absolutely no influence about what policies are going to be enacted in the first place. Right, I mean, right. he may be a first-term candidate. He may be a guy who's in a junior position in the party. He's not going to do anything to change your immediate circumstances in your locality whatsoever. Even if you think he's a great guy, he may not be even in that position. Yeah, and, and we don't, again, with it, like the difference in the marketplace and this is uh, you wouldn't go down to Tesco and they they hold a vote for, okay, who's going to be the CEO of Tesco? We, whoever we vote for, they're going to be the manager for the next four years, no matter what, okay? And basically, whatever they say goes. Well, I mean, no no organization on earth would ever do that, you know, relying on customers' money, relying on continual support from, from customers and the people yes. who basically, I mean, it is vote, the marketplace is voting. We vote with money. And you go down to Tesco and you say, yes, I want this product. Or you say, okay, Tesco, you're too expensive. I'm going down to, to Super Value or to Centra or wherever. And I'm going to get this product and this. And, and, um, and we, every, we make those decisions every day. In fact, multiple times a day. And it's, it's such an insane amount of calculation that each individual person does. Just, just even the basic. I mean, they get, we say the average person, even on minimum wage, they get their paycheck every week. And they're managing, you know, they're managing so many factors. They're going in and they're saying, okay, well, this week I can only get one um, pack of cheese and, and one, maybe, you know, I'll get, I'll get, you know, two loaves of bread and put one in the freezer for next week. And they're like constantly evaluating the prices and all these incredible calculations. I know it's, it, it sounds silly, but it's, it really is a remarkable amount of calculation that someone does just by going into a supermarket that to then expect a political class or somebody that you vote for to be able to take into consideration even one person's decision making, um, what what they would decide if they were allowed to, um, yeah. Then, but now you actually have to deal with four million people and what they would decide to do, and like that's insane. It's just absolutely nuts. Some people like Tesco, some people like Lidl, some people like Super Value, and people can change any time they want. Whereas, because you know, because it's constantly down to the service they provide, who they're always battling each other. Whereas with politics. And, and with government, when you vote somebody in, that, that's it. You're stuck with them. If they say, if, if Coke said, oh, man, this, this Coke is amazing. If you drink it, you can fly to space. And you drink it and you can't fly to space. You just go, okay, that, that sucks. I'm not going to buy Coke again. Whereas, whereas you vote for a, a T-shirt and he says, okay, I'm going to provide, you know, everybody, I'm going to send everybody five grand in the mail uh, tomorrow if you vote me in. And then he doesn't do it. Well, you're still kind of stuck with him. You know, it's like. You know, you know, if it was the government producing that drink, it would be your fault that you wouldn't be able to buy it. <laughs> it certainly wouldn't be anything to do with those. Well, that's that's a good point. I mean, when any anytime something goes right, they they say, yeah, that was us. That was our policy. And anytime something goes wrong, it's oh, that's uh, there wasn't enough regulation or that was the, yeah. the marketplace. Or, or, or back to your point about the supermarket. I mean, the guy on the minimum wage going in, the government solution to that would be raise the minimum wage. <laughs> <laughs> Oh, that's a whole other podcast right there. <laughs> um, actually, you, you, you brought up uh, the term Austrian a yes. couple of times. Now, just for, for people who are listening who don't know what Austrian means, it's, it's not the nationality in this particular context. Um, if you could just, could you explain a little bit just, just what Austrian means? Yeah, I mean, it, it, it's a broad school, really. It's a school of economics. I mean, you have various different schools of economics. Uh, the Austrian school happens to be one of them. I mean, primarily led by the work that Ludwig von Mises did. You have Friedrich Hayek in there as well, who is a Nobel Prize winner. That really drew people's attention to it. Essentially, I mean, Austrian economics is about how the market functions. The market functions as a result, as you were saying, of various different, complicated, very rational and irrational human action, you know, from humans who can actually act, who are capable of acting. It also suggests that the market solves its own problems because the market is made up of these multiple millions and billions of human actions, and therefore the market can basically sort itself out. Whereas you would have the traditional school, which means basically the Keynesian school from, from Lord Keynes, which basically suggests that you know without government interference, 
the market, i.e. normal, rational or irrational people, cannot rule themselves, cannot make decisions themselves. Therefore, the government has to be involved. So if the government creates a problem, they're basically the ones who can solve the problem. And usually that involves a printing press. And therefore, this is the world we live in now because it's Keynesian economics. Basically, what happens is if we have a crisis that's created by a government, the government comes in to solve the crisis and creates an even bigger crisis. The Austrians see things a little bit differently and see the government as having no role whatsoever in the market. Right. And when you say printing press, you're referring specifically to their ability to print money whenever they feel like it. Their ability to counterfeit, yes. Yeah. Le legalize counterfeiting. <laughs> legalize counterfeiting, yes. I mean, people don't seem to understand that the reason inflation occurs is simply because of an increase in the money supply. I mean, the increase in supply of any other good, whether it's sugar, beer, corn, anything you like, is always a good thing. The only bad thing is the increase in the money supply because automatically, where you had a hundred euro, it's Basically, if they print another 100 euro, well then, sorry, your money is now worth half of what it was an hour ago. No other authority on the planet can do that. But governments, through their central banks, through the likes of the ECB in Europe, the Federal Reserve in the USA, if debts are outstanding in, in corporate bodies, if the government runs out of money, IOUs, etc., like that, all they do is just print more money which is basically what's causing most of the problems in the world. But that's my opinion. <laughs> and would I be correct now? I, I, I have to doubly, doubly uh, check this, but I, I've heard that the very first uh, currency that was initiated based on nothing, so it wasn't like a paper receipt to, yes. to something. The euro was actually the first currency in world history, at least in recorded world history, to be a paper money that is not a receipt to any actual tangible um, sure. material, it at least didn't originate that way. Like the dollar, the, the pound sterling was obviously a pound of sterling silver. The dollar yes. is, comes from the Dutch tolar, which again is another weight of, I think that's a weight of silver as well. Um, I, I have to, you know, I, I'm a bit rusty on all that stuff, but the euro, it began its life as paper. And like yeah. if, if you were to go next door and say, here, here's one Gareth, uh, it's worth, you know, you can buy a whole car with it. I mean, you know, I, I'd, be, I'd be laughed out of it, but but the, the European Union actually came along, or the ECB came along and said, okay, here is some paper, we promise it's worth something, and then everybody believes it, so it is, so as long as it, everyone believes yeah. it is, it works. But, but I mean, all, all paper currency, which would, what would be termed as fiat currency, fiat currency, basically, it's, it's all a promissory note. We hear a lot in Ireland about a promissory note. Every paper denomination of euro that you carry in your wallet is essentially a promissory note. Um, it's a promise that if you put this across the counter in a store that you will get X value of goods. I mean, it, this is where it comes from. I mean, originally going back to your point about where money evolved from, it evolved from something solid. What we have essentially these days, certainly in the Western world, um, is the fact that when, you know, when somebody had gold and they brought it to the goldsmith to store it, he would issue them a receipt, you know, and say like this, you have lodged, you know, a hundred uh, pounds of gold with us. So, you know, here's a receipt so you can go out and spend that on goods. But of course, what happened was the, the goldsmith just issued as many as he wanted. And then when people went looking for their gold, he didn't have it. <laughs> I mean, essentially, this is where we're getting now. We've just taken the commodity out of the situation and all you simply have is paper. And when you have paper, I mean, it's it's another way of looking at the world. But I mean, essentially, pieces of paper control your life, of which the value continues to change, not in a way that benefits you. Very good. And yeah, that's I mean, I was looking at some historical examples of, of where the whole notion came from. And, you know, because like, you know, people really would. I mean, if, if you're to point out to them. This really is just paper. Somebody just gave you paper, and yes. it's like they've never really considered it. I mean, I'm talking fifty, sixty year old people who who've never really considered what they're holding in their wallet is is just 
some paper like it, it doesn't so like what is money supposed to be like what what is it supposed to when you look at how it would come about normally in a marketplace and how it did come about historically as as something that you couldn't just print off whenever you wanted you had to dig it out of the ground you had to hire labor you had to get machinery you had to you, you couldn't just create it whenever you wanted you really had to work for it and it's something that was precious and like people use gold for jewelry and, and for of course today technology all sorts of electronic goods and that it has an actual tangible value that um uh, that people want other than what it's for, other than its ability to be exchanged. Um, so, like, historically, kings, up until quite recently, um, kings who wanted to raise more money, like, they had to borrow from the bank, and the banks would give them huge interest rates because governments are non-producing. They don't, they don't invest, they don't build factories, they don't do that kind of stuff. They, they are takers. So the only way that a bank is going to give them money is if they could show them, okay, we're going to go over and loot this village over here. We think that this, this amount of this stuff is here, so we're going to, we'll give you some of that and that'll be your interest. But the in it's such a risky deal because the king might get killed or whatever that they get interest rated like 50% or 60%. Um, whereas just recently enough, uh, like 200 years ago or so, I can't remember which king it was, um, and again, I have to double check all these facts, but at, um, uh, basically the story goes something like the king wanting to raise more money did a deal with this uh, banker, uh, this central bank guy, who, um, or obviously before he was a central bank, where they said, okay, the king will make whatever currency this bank produces legal tender, which means you have to accept it um, in exchange for being able to get as much money from that bank whenever they want it. So they would be able to, the bank would provide them with money uh, through the central bank and then that government or that, that king would then give that back out to the smaller banks. And instead of the, the king now borrowing from the banks, the banks are actually borrowing from the king. It's, it's this amazing turnaround where the banks are now um, subject to, the, to the, the government and the government can create the money, of course, I mean, now they don't have to, I mean, of course, they, they don't want to hyperinflate. If they do it too much, the, the, the currency is worth nothing, so they still have to tax and stuff. But you have to offset so like you don't want people paying for it for 10 or 15 years so you get this debt and you want to be able to create more money to buy stuff now and then pay for it later but you know after people yes. have forgotten about the you know oh you've done all this great stuff but of course and, and this comes back to the kids having to pay for it our kids are going to have to pay for this because that's how long it's going to take to, to ricochet back into the economy now inflation as you said you know that, that that can take a few months before you see that but it's it's still so detached that people can't tell oh the, the government caused that and the politicians, they, they come on the news and they're always talking about, okay, we're, we're going to fight inflation. We have this policy and that policy for fighting inflation. We, we need to get inflation down uh, with, with the exception of, of Ben Bernanke in the States. I think he actually came out and said it was a good thing because, you know, it's getting their debt down, the value of their debt down. But, um, but politicians actually, in Ireland, I've still heard them say, um, you know, uh, we're fighting inflation. And, of course, that's complete nonsense because... Yeah, they, the government can, uh, you know, I mean, they have value added tax, which is on every single good you purchase in this country. Um, for them to say that, you know, increasing taxes on the value added tax plays no part in the inflationary model is, is absolutely ridiculous. I mean, if you, if you buy, you know, a liter of diesel, chances are that about 65% of that price is actually, you know, going straight to the government in the form of coercive taxation. And it's, it's, it's a nonsense to suggest that they can't influence inflation. Yes, they can, but they don't want to because it's their main source of revenue. And I mean, most taxes, like they say, oh, this is a consumption tax, you know, when people are spending money, they're not going to notice it because they want to buy the goods anyway. There's no such thing as a consumption tax. It's always a tax on production. And that's the problem. So at the outset, the government encourages people through taxation to be less productive. You know, they, they, um, they increase, you know, the, the cost of living. It's harder to buy, you know, a loaf of bread today than it was 20 years ago. It'll cost you a lot more. People think that's because, you know, well, the ingredients in bread must have, you know, m multiplied in price exponentially. Not true. <laughs> you know, it's simply because the money you have in your pocket today is worth a hell of a lot less than it was you know, 20 years ago. And the main reason for that is because around the world, central banks are printing money. And so would it be fair to say that 
a great deal of the world's problems comes from the, I know it's a broad statement, but a great deal <laughs> of the world's problems comes from careful, <laughs> careful now, yeah, uh, government's ability to, to, to print money whenever they want because they can circumvent the normal process that, that's supposed to underpin human activity. Like, I, don't, I want to be careful saying supposed to because I, I, yes. I want to keep values out of it. But um, like if, if I want to get a new car, I need to work and save for that new car. I don't just get to have the car. And, and the reason that's important is in order for me to get something that costs, you know, like thousands and thousands of hours of labor, in fact, hundreds of years worth of, of, of technology and people's decisions have gone into making this, this car. When you just take all the individual components, you know, it has lights that were invented 200 years ago and glass and people invested in rubber plantations that, that led to, you know, the tires being built the way they are, you know, over, the, over hundreds of years, literally millions of people to create just one car. All of them have provided this value into the, into the, the economy. And for me to just grab a car and say, okay, that's mine now, it, it, that really doesn't get it. What's important is for me to now provide value into the economy first, and then whoever provides me with that, whoever pays me, or my boss, or you know, if I'm a contractor or whatever, wh whoever I'm working for, or whatever kind of service I'm, I'm selling, whatever product I'm selling, people want that, and they get a benefit out of that. And so because they benefit, they provide me with money, and then I can now spend that, that benefit that, that they got. I can now cash that in. On, on a new car, whereas the government can, without providing any service up front, like they're, they claim that they're going to provide the service if they get the money. Um, of course, they don't. I mean, there's always going to be stuff you could say, yeah, the government did this right and the government did that, but, you know, um, throw enough crap at a wall and it, some of it sticks. I mean, of course, it, like by random accident, you have to be doing good things when you're throwing that kind of money around and you have that many people involved. But the, it's, a, it's a net loss. The, uh, as a system, it's a net loss because all it does is it consumes out of the economy. And so by, by the added tool of being able to print money whenever they want, that means they can buy stuff whenever they want. Um, that's really got to cause some very, very serious side effects in, in the world. Yeah, I mean, it completely distorts the market. I mean, we, we're no strangers to it here in this country. We're the prime example at the moment. I mean, it's... Uh, it's absolutely crazy that we're going to be paying back, you know, this debt that none of us had any part of, that none of us created for, you know, the next few decades. But that's, I mean, like, did nobody think that, you know, in Dublin, the capital city of Ireland, that, you know, that apartments there should be more expensive than they are in some of the largest cities in the world? I mean, this was all part of government legislation that opened up, you know, easy lending. There was no regulation at all. The central bank here and the regulator were incompetent. I mean, dare I say it, in collusion with the government, you know, because it was very nice to see a boom in economy. But people don't seem to understand that an economic boom is basically down to masses of credit that washed in here from Germany. You know, they came into us. We were the drain for that money. And uh, now we're all paying it back. But, I mean, just to go, I mean, this money never existed in the first place. And we're paying it back. That's one what's really wrong with when governments interfere in the market. I mean, you bring up the, the thing about a car. I would have no problem uh, paying motor tax in this country if it was ring fenced to actually go and improve in roads. The problem is motor tax and every other tax is not ring fenced. It will just go into a black hole. You know, if I use the roads, I expect the roads to improve or be of a certain standard. But that never actually happens. I mean, it's like the classic libertarian cartoon that I'm sure you've seen, you know, where the kid arrives home to the father and says, you know, you know, the worst thing ever, you know, dad, I have something very important to tell you about my lifestyle. And the father goes, well, what's that, son? He goes, I'm a libertarian. And uh, the, <laughs> the father jumps out the window, you know, my roads, my roads, where are my roads? <laughs> <You know? laughs> but um. But what we don't seem to understand is when we pay tax, if it's motor tax, if it's a TV license, you know, we expect a certain quality or a certain standard or a certain improvement. That does not happen. I mean, most of our taxes now are going to pay private bondholders who are essentially large international investment banks who can create money when they want. But we're basically on the hook for that and will be for a long time to come. 
Right, and I think it's important. Well, actually, uh, two points there. First of all, liber- again, libertarianism is another um, word that has kind of uh, it's got many meanings, uh, yeah. uh, mostly negative. So I want to maybe try and fix that here, uh, if we could, and just I break it down. If you said they were negative. <laughs> <laughs> right, um, but the like the the key underpinning thing I think that unites uh, at least at least a good a good chunk of libertarians. Um, I think the only thing you could say for certain, uh, well, not even I, I know there are people who disagree with this, but um, but I would say that the important issue with libertarianism, the the one principle is the idea of non-aggression, the yeah. idea that it's not okay to impose on somebody else the, like it's that's it's not like this you know lay down kind of pacifism type thing it's not about that you you can still like obviously someone breaks into your home it's not like you know run out the door and run away and leave the house and let them have it that's that's not what yeah. it's about that's not non-aggression non-aggression is the idea that it's not okay to initiate so it's not okay to throw the first punch it's not okay to you know um now again that's you know if there's a threat a threat counts as 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 aggression as well so someone says i'm going to shoot you in the face it's okay if you had a gun to shoot them first, if they make a clear, incredible threat, or whatever, that's you know, not to go off in another rabbit hole here, but um, uh, libertarianism is is the idea that it's not okay to impose on somebody, and that would include then, of course, taxation um, is wrong for that reason. It's not like we just we just feel like oh, tax is a bad idea. I don't like paying tax. It's not really about the feelings. It's about it's it has to be wrong to do that because if somebody can do that then anybody can do that it's it's a, it would have to be a universal thing what would make the government different to us and of course that's why democracy is used as this tool it's like oh well what makes the government separate what makes it okay for them to take money is that we've all consented to it but then it wouldn't be taking it so it wouldn't be stealing it, it would be it wouldn't be theft but the fact that i did not consent to it uh, makes it theft and so that's that's what like for me to be taxed now i, I get your point about you know paying the motor tax you pay motor tax yeah. and they spend it on the roads of course they're not doing that you can you can see but yes i mean like what you're saying is basically paying somebody to do a job i mean that's that's something that that is the definition of 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 market and um i want something done i'm going to pay someone to do it so of course i mean you couldn't have any problem paying for something um, to get it done, but the, the problem is when you're dealing with people who take money by force, is that they really don't have to do a good job. So they can no. get they can get mo- all this money and then not spend it on anything for you. And what are you going to do? Because you know democracy has spoken. So and I'd like to point out as well that um, the, it's not like the, the market. Uh, probably important to d- define market here. Um, the market is kind of the arena where everybody just makes decisions voluntarily. So it's not just about trade. It's not just about, you know, going to a shop and haggling. I mean, that's not what free market means. It's not what market, it's part, that's part of it. But the market is every single, it's like every voluntary transaction kind of fits into that, that umbrella. And so um, I want to point out that by definition, tax can't fit into that because it's an involuntary transaction. Precisely right. And that's, that's, that's it. So the market really isn't, I mean, it's, a lot of people like to compare, you know, say government and market are, are opposites. And so when you have, you know, problems in government and then you say, well, I, I don't like the government because of this. I don't think it's a good idea to have democracy. I think it's really, really silly. I think we can prove it's silly. Um, and then they'll come back and say, well, you know, how will the market fix it? And, of course, I don't have an answer for everything of how the market will fix it because the market really isn't a direct opposite. The, the market is the environment where the solutions occur. It's not the solution. The market is not a solution. The market is the environment of, of voluntary transactions and voluntary action, uh, whereas government is is its own type of solution. It's, you know, these, a bunch of people think that they can fix things a certain way. It would be, it'd be like me saying, I don't think we should rape women. And then they would say, well, how do you think we should not rape them? You know, it's like, <laughs> we, should, we should just not do that. And then we come up with good stuff that we can do with women. You know, <laughs> it's like... Have a steering committee, yeah. <laughs> yes, that's it. Yeah, yeah. So, so it's, not, um, it's not like we have the answers to everything by saying, oh, the free market is better than, is better than government. It's that the free market will have the answers eventually. Yeah. At least, um, whereas government cannot, because government um, uh, is is it doesn't have any feedback mechanism. It doesn't. It it, it has no intelligence. There's no intelligence right. there. It's yeah. just it's yeah, visceral. It's really, right. Yeah. I mean, it's like you you would say. I think. I mean, in, in in what civic duty? You know, when you say, you know, I mean, the government has an opinion that we are inadequate as a people. 
But I mean, when you put a government into action, you, you see that they're inadequate on all levels to do the job that you've elected them for in the first place. Right. right. I mean, that's, a, that's a very big point. I mean, you elect them to provide mostly in, a, in the modern welfare state to provide education, to provide health care, to provide transport, to provide all these things. And on every single level, every day when you pick up a newspaper, you will see they're inadequate in all of those levels. But oh God, you know, I mean, the market people themselves couldn't sort out these problems. So we're here. Here's the government, you know. That's right. When you're surrounded by this stuff, it really is far easier to just go along with it. And I think, you know, because people aren't motivated first by, by things like truth and reason, that, that's not what motivates them. There's, not, there's nothing fundamentally wrong with not being motivated by that stuff. Um, but it is wrong when it starts to interfere with other people. And it starts to interfere. Like if you, I have no problem if somebody wants to set up a democratic order somewhere. Um, they have a community and everybody who wants, I mean, that's effectively what we have in, in tons of organizations anyway, you, you know, voting does happen outside the government. Like there are, there are votes that take place, even in families, we say, okay, who wants to go to the beach? Who wants to go to the cinema? And, and people will yeah. vote and, uh, and you can say, oh, but that's, that's just imposing force. Of course it's, it's not because, you know, um, oh, that's, again, it's, that's a, it's a very good point though. You bring up the family. I mean, I, I'm in the same position as yourself, you know, I mean, would you elect your wife to have a monopoly on violence in your house? Because <laughs> I know I certainly wouldn't. <laughs> she, she just took that, actually. I, I, we don't need to have a vote. She actually has that already. Yeah, so. have to say, well, we're the same. <laughs> yeah, that, just, that, was, that was given. That was a given, anyway. I'm so glad. I think she's in the next room, and I have headphones, and so she didn't hear what you said. So I think I, I, think I got away with that. <laughs> but this is going online, so maybe not. Um, <laughs> 